I am happy and privileged to introduce Nikki Pozos with Formation Labs. Uh, Nikki brings a diverse background encompassing a PhD in civil engineering, past work as a life coach, and current work at the intersection of social equity and public infrastructure. She aspires to be the world's first engineering psychologist, <laughs> bringing engineering thinking to understanding what makes people tick. So please help me in welcoming uh, Nikki, presenting on advanced, advancing equity within different organizational structures. Thank you. I know I, I, when I got this template, I was not at all sure of how I was supposed to put the title on this thing, but, um, but that's what I went with. <laughs> so why this topic? Um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. I, I see so many organizations trying to advance equity within their organizations, and I think that's tremendous. At the same time, I see that there's people within those organizations that are feeling rejected by those same initiatives. And in many cases, the silos that we have between field staff and office staff are just getting worse. I also see a lot of people who are talking all the talk about advancing equity. It's not really translating into real action and can in itself be, be very destructive. So, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon, and, you know, we talk a lot in Portland about white Portland that likes to talk a lot about BIPOC people, perhaps endlessly, but it's not a place where a lot of people of color feel included and belonging a lot of the time. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that. So what can this look like? I, I actually want to start with a story about my school. So my, no longer my school, but my kids went here for eight years. So we've been part of the school community for eight years and it's the Sunnyside Environmental School. It's probably the most white Portland place within white Portland, I think. And um, you know, it's a place where people are talk about d diversity, equity and inclusion endlessly. And there's some great things about that. Like we have an incredible um, education program about local indigenous people. Um, they do learn about shootings of black males in our <laughs> communities. And they did learn the real story of Columbus. So I think there's a lot of really positive things about it, but also it's a place where very, very few families of color feel at home. And it's interesting, I actually ended up getting canceled at this school. I got to go through the experience of being canceled. And you're thinking, well, what did you do, Nikki? Like, did you say something really bad about transgender people or something? No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> I actually got canceled over advocating for schools to reopen. And I happened to be the Facebook manager for the school and people like went to town on me and they really, people called me names, they tried to bully me, they piled on and people thought this was absolutely acceptable. And other people were even afraid to say that they wanted to send their child back to school because they would be texting me, they're like, I just can't go in there because they were so afraid of what would happen to them. And the interesting thing is I wanted kids to be back in school because I knew of specific brown kids who were not attending school during online school. And I knew that they needed to get back into school before they never went back to school. Yet the people who were canceling me um, did call me racist. They called me anti-union. They called me anti-teacher and any whatever else they wanted to call me. And this is, of course, the slogan that came out on the most recent t-shirt for the school, Be You, Be True. And what that really means is if you're a white college educated liberal person who believes everything that the dominant voices at this school believe, then please feel free to go about your life here unmitigated and unconcerned about thinking about anybody else. And I think sometimes people think if only the right people were in charge who care about equity, who care about social justice and racism that we would just see so much action but I think it's just a lot more complicated than that. And often the words that people are saying are really missing the mark when it comes to their actions. So I think you can have all the right values, but that doesn't naturally make you inclusive. It really is a different thing. So for me, the question on my mind these days is how do we find our we? Like how do we actually advance equity without leaving parts of our organization behind? And if we walk through an equity journey, and people are hating each other. It's just different people hating different people. I'm not really sure how much we've gained through that. I always say, um, you know, racism is founded in us and them thinking. And sometimes the way people try to address racism is, well, now the brown people get to be the us's and you white guys get to be the them's. 
And it turns out white males don't like to be thems any more than anyone else does because none of us wants to be the them, right? Everyone wants to be in the we. So I think it's about how do we actually find the we in our organizations and still advance racial equity and other forms of equity without just leaving everyone behind, so. And I believe learning to build bridges across our differences is the challenge of our times. I mean, you look at what's going on in our country, in our organizations, in our communities, and figuring out how to do this, we're very bad at this right now. And finding those ways to build bridges really matters. And I look at water wastewater utilities, and we often have people from different sides of the political spectrum. We have people with different levels of, you know, we have college educated people, we have non-college educated people, we have people who do all sorts of different kinds of jobs. And to me, we have a unique opportunity um, where we can actually be some of the ones to start figuring out how we can build those bridges. So I'm gonna talk today about a system called Spiral Dynamics because um, I love the system. And I think when it comes to culture, we don't have a lot of language to talk about culture. Um, you know, we're not trained in thinking about different types of cultures. And um, when we do think of words, we're often thinking of negative words to describe those people that frustrate us and not the positive ones. So um, this is based on a system called Spiral Dynamics Integral. There's no good book about it. They're all terrible, but you can find stuff online about it. And I'll just say, it's not about like typing people that you are just this and you were just that. That's not the point. To me, it's important to have a way of thinking about culture and thinking about different value systems. Um, and anyone can be totally lost in their own value system and have their blinders on and think completely black and white that my way of thinking is the only way of thinking. And in the same way, anyone can also be more open and see the other perspectives. So it's not just like, hey, you're in this box. People have different levels of comfort with these three different value systems. And um, a lot of the power comes is when you can kind of dance between them and see the value in all of them. So I'm gonna be talking about blue, which is kind of order and purpose. Orange, independence and achievement, and green, community and equality. And those are not the official names, I will say. So this is a very important one when it comes to equity work is the blue value system. And they use colors because it's easy to remember that way. You know, within this value system, rules are supposed to be consistent, fair, and uniformly applied. Um, they value individual responsibility. You need to take care of your own family, your own people, and they take that responsibility very seriously. Um, comfortable with hierarchy and earning your place in the hierarchy. And individuals are expected to conform to the expectations and norms of the group to maintain harmony and order. It's not about everyone being special. It's about, hey, there's rules about how we behave here. There's these things called um, being uh, polite. And we do that because we all agree that we're gonna behave in a certain manner to make it nice here for everybody. And they influence behavior through punishment. Um, it's not really through incentive so much as like, if you screw up and go to line, you'll be punished. But I think one of the interesting thing is once you've done your punishment, you get to come back. Um, so what kind of organizations in, in our world, what kind of aspects of our organizations are often reflect this type of value system? Come on, Muriel. Oh, sure. Uh, schools. schools tend to be like that, not my particular school, but yes, a lot of schools are like that. What about within utilities? What aspects are kind of have this blue value system? Near is like, damn, is she gonna, Mark? Yeah. So a lot of utilities, this almost used to be the very uniform way that all utilities were, right? That um, I've heard people many times say, yes, the military is like this. And a lot of people have said, oh, it's easy to go from the military to, to a utility because we run kind of the same way. You know, this is very typical of smaller utilities, not as typical of larger utilities, but this is very much the way unions um, are functioning. And certainly even within larger utilities, this is very uh, common among the field staff divisions that they come from this blue value system. And again, I'm gonna be generalizing some, it's hard not to generalize at all. Of course, that's not gonna be true everywhere and certainly not true of every person within an organization. So a typical barrier is not understanding that a system that they've personally experienced as fair has not been fair to everyone. And I think what people underappreciate about this is they really do care about fairness. And I wish people tried to hook into that more, that they want things to be fair. It's just when you've experienced things as fair, it's just really hard to see things from other people's perspective. And that's where I think it kind of falls down. Um, so I, how can we connect with these folks? 
So I have a bit of a pet peeve around, I know I'm an equity practitioner. I have a bit of a pet peeve around equity language because it changes continually. And I look at terms like people in Portland have gone from saying homelessness to houselessness. If I asked 10 people what the difference between homelessness and houselessness is, I would get 10 different answers, though five of them would be the same, which is I don't even have an idea of why I think I say that. So what, what happens in equity is the language kind of trends in different directions. And people who are more hip with the latest term sound kind of more woke or you, you're like, okay, they're more, they care more about equity because they've known the latest term that they know they're gonna say houselessness, they're not gonna say homelessness. Even though for most people that term is absolutely meaningless, that, that terminology change. Um, so when I'm talking in general, I try not to always use the latest terminology. Uh, I tend never to say Latinx, for example, because so many Latino and Latina people I know hate the term. I've heard many more white people say Latinx than I've heard actual Latino people say Latinx. So I try to be more general, like people of color, people know what I'm talking about. I don't always say BIPOC because not everybody always knows what BIPOC means. And I think when we're trying to get people to join in the conversation, if they're just sitting there afraid they're going to say the wrong word the whole time, and I'm not talking about racist slurs, I'm talking about just like whether they know the current terminology, helping people like set the stage of what they what words we're going to be using is really helpful. And then I, I don't try to focus on what words you're using. I think we put so much focus and equity on what words people are using, and that's really not helping people a whole lot. I haven't heard a lot of black people who actually care about the term master bedroom or master schedule. Um, but there's people who are doing equity initiatives who are like, we're gonna banish the word master schedule. And I'm like, why? Um, so using the language of equality really helps. The program is here so everyone has a fair chance to move up the ladder. Um, we want every candidate to see someone like themselves on the interview panel. So that kind of all language, and it's the same thing. You know, when we say we wanna make sure that a person of color who comes and interviews with us can see themselves on the panel, that is the same thing as we want every candidate to see someone like themselves on their interview panel. I haven't seen any panels that are lacking in white males, but that doesn't mean it couldn't in the future. And if a white male is coming in to interview, I also think we should have someone on the panel that represents them because I think everyone should get to have someone on the panel that represents them. Um, I think race only, Programs are really challenging for this group. Um, programs that are based on socioeconomics tend to be a lot better received. And in general, I, I think of race only programs are very, um, they are justice in many cases, but I don't know that they work really well. Um, so in my own personal experience, I tend not to advocate for race only programs. And that um, I'm also suspicious of programs that are absent of race. So. I, I think race has to be called out and has to be in there, but broader programs tend to be a lot better received. And also they just engage in them in conversation. Don't make assumptions about who they are and what they believe. Um, and I feel very strongly about this last point, which is if you wanna engage your field staff, you better have taken a serious look in the mirror about how you treat them first. So I always say field staff always get bias right away because almost every single one of them has experienced bias which is some engineer who treats them like they're idiot because they don't have an, uh, a degree or because they work in the field. And almost all field staff have experienced that. So they do know what bias is. Now, in a lot of organizations, they are treated like second-class citizens. There's often this big divide. And then they see the people who have the power at the organization, the ones who are making the most money, who have the most influence. And they come and say, hey, you field staff, you're not doing enough for equity. And they're like, what the heck are you talking about? Because they're being subject to bias a lot of the time and they're dealing with that power dynamic. So I say, if you wanna get your operation staff on board, like look in the mirror first and really look at what are the power dynamics in your organization and how are you treating people inside your organization first? And this comes up a lot with things like houselessness or homelessness. Um, you know, people who are not in the field are like, hey, we need to treat homeless people better. We need to be part of the solution and everything. And that is great. And also they forget that people who are out in the field are actually dealing with people one-on-one. -on -one. They're dealing with fearing for their safety. And unless you acknowledge that, that they disproportionately are bearing the burden for, for dealing with those challenges, if you don't start by acknowledging that, you don't start by acknowledging that their situation puts them in a different position when it relates to a lot of these issues, then you're not gonna get very far. 
And that bad is on you for doing that. Like if you're not thinking through that, you're just doing the same way to thing to them. And I laugh, I was talking to one organization, they said, um, field staff were saying during the pandemic how hard it was to have to go in the field. And, and literally at the time, they truly felt like they were risking their lives to have to go to work. And the engineer's response to that was, well, it wasn't my choice. It, it wasn't my choice, that's just how it worked out. So I don't have to acknowledge it. And I'm like, isn't that just like when we say I don't have to acknowledge racism because I wasn't the one who had a slave? Like, isn't that pretty much exactly the same thing? But they didn't see that. They didn't see that they're like, hey, if I don't acknowledge that a person in the field has to bear a disproportionate burden from homelessness, or I don't acknowledge that people in the field had to bear a disproportionate burden from the pandemic, in their own risk to themselves and their families, then you're just not starting from much. So I just say, start by really acknowledging those things. And I see some of those rifts in different organizational cultures, they caused a real rift, um, a lot because of that lack of acknowledgement. And we came out of the pandemic and a lot of equity work took off after that. And without those things really being acknowledged and kind of healed that, hey, we didn't acknowledge that we who got the opportunity to work remotely, who didn't have to risk our children, who didn't have to um, not be able to school our children who are all having school from home, if we don't really acknowledge all that stuff, it's really hard for us to move forward. So. Oh, I forgot one last point and this is, the other people who are really in, very common in this value system would be communities of color. <laughs> So if you think of communities of color, this is much more reflective of their value system than the other value systems we're talking about a lot of the time. And that's why we see a lot of the time this disconnect between the people who are advocating for equity often are not from this value system, but the people they're advocating for actually are a lot of the time. And I sometimes laugh because I thought if rural people and communities of color understood how alike they were, like what would change about that? Like they actually have so similar values. Um, and so that's one of the disconnects I think we see a lot of the time. So the orange value is about kind of independence and achievement. You know, there should be rules, but we should keep them minimal. Let's not get in the way of getting things done. And um, they value individual agency and achievement. They believe in meritocracy, efficiency. We're gonna be growing and getting better endlessly. Um, high performers are given a lot of leeway to deviate from rules and norms. Um, and anyone who's worked at a consulting company will know exactly what this one is. Because if there's a guy who's really good at selling things, that guy will get away with whatever the hell he wants to get away with. Now, this doesn't seem to apply to women, unfortunately. But um, women will get away with a little bit more. But a guy who can sell stuff at a consulting company can get away with almost anything. Um, and you influence behavior through performance incentives, pay, and status. So a lot of what falls down here is, of course, you know, we are not, there's no such thing as a pure meritocracy. Um, our organizations, even if we think of them as meritocracies, um, we, are, we are not pure meritocracies. And they, people can fail to see the role that bias and systemic advantages had in their own achievement. And so again, they believe it's a meritocracy. A lot of it is, again, getting people to see through new eyes that, okay, maybe this wasn't an even playing field. So I gave you a hint, what kind of organizations tend to be in this? consulting firms are very hard for this, right? And consulting firms are very outcomes-based. And one of the things that I've noticed when people go from consulting firms to the public side is suddenly things are very process-based instead of outcome-based. The outcome kind of comes way down and process goes way up. And it's a huge culture shift. Um, and that's because public agencies don't tend to be in here. There are some larger public agencies that have kind of a tone of this. It's kind of a mix. Um, this is much more common at very large agencies for sure. So how do you connect to oranges? They are the believers in science. Um, so research and data, data and research, they don't care about your sob story or your um, really uh, the story of what people have experienced. They wanna know data. They're like, oh, that just sounds anecdotal. So you have to focus on data and organizational benefits. These are the people who are like, yes, that study from the Harvard Business Review that said that you will be 10% higher performing if you have a more divorce, diver, diverse organization, they're the ones who are gonna to respond to that. The idea that diversity makes us better. Um, you do have to do your homework. And I think this is kind of true of all types. I think doing your homework and actually identifying very specific barriers versus being all general and just making assumptions about what's gonna help is really helpful. Developing a system for addressing those barriers and then measuring and reporting on the outcomes. You know, They want it to be science. 
Um, and there's nothing Orange loves more than STEM programs for kids, truly. Because if you go talk to an engineering consulting company and you ask what they wanna do for equity, if the first thing they didn't say was STEM programs for kids, I'm wondering who you're talking to. <laughs> and why do you think Orange loves STEM programs for kids? Because they still really believe in the meritocracy and they're like, oh, I am kind of acknowledging maybe it's not an even playing field, but if only I could reach a child, then that playing field would become even and I wouldn't have to change how I do everything else. <laughs> of course, the other reason why people choose STEM programs for kids is because if you look at the entry-level equity program, it always involves things that don't mess with existing power structures and value systems and just kind of dance around the outside. It's always mentoring programs for women and people of color, it's resource groups, and it's um, unconscious bias training. And if you can find a place who will take you, STEM programs for kids. Unfortunately, there are so many people trying to do this, it's actually kind of hard to find a place that will take you if they're trying to do that. So um, it's just another thing that also doesn't mess with power. So all of these systems, when we go to do equity work, it tends to be that we're trying not to upset the status quo of how we do things already. And then the last one is the green one, and it's kind of about community inequality. You know, rules are very relative and subjective. You know, what is good and what is bad? Um, they embrace equity, they embrace things like reparations, um, they're anti-hierarchical and they're very pluralistic. So everyone has a voice. There's a huge focus on everyone having a voice and the freedom to identify and express yourself as you choose. Um, they're very oriented to communication and process. Not a lot of action a lot of times. You know, If you are in a green organization, you go to a lot of meetings and they last a really, really, really long time. And then they influence behavior through threat of outgrouping that they do cancel you. Um, and I think the difference between this type of punishment and what the blue level does is the blues like you're going to do your punishment and then when you've done your punishment you sucked it up, then you can come back. Whereas orange is more like ostracism, uh, green sorry is more like ostracism like you are out you're not one of us and you are rejected and kicked out of here. So a huge barrier for green is confusing that their advocacy for underrepresented groups. I will question whether it's true advocacy a lot of times they're talking a lot about underrepresented groups is the same as aligning with those groups. I advocate for them. That means that they want the same things that I do and that they actually agree with the things that I think and say. This is often not true because I just pointed out a lot of the people they're advocating for do not necessarily come from this value system, especially when it comes to people of color. So um, that is a huge blindness. So instead of how do we connect with these, I said this one, how can we make programs more effective? Because it's very rare to have equity initiatives that are not founded through this value system. You know, Green is the ones who started this. Um, and so a lot of the language that we use in equity programs is very consistent with what they believe. Like that's the words they wanna use. And that's what when I was talking about using that blue language of things like fairness, um, because that is what we're trying to accomplish by the way, when we get, um, equitable programs, we're trying to get fair outcomes, right? So when we mix up the language more, the language tends to be all over to this side. Um, so again, recognize that many of the people you want to help do not belong to the green value system, um, that people of color are not just a concept called BIPOC. They're actually human beings. Maybe you want to know some of them. <laughs> uh, and to keep the mission of their organization at the center and build equity into delivering that mission. One thing that kind of happened during the pandemic is there's a big movement toward equity at the center. I mean, there's actually an organization called Equity at the Center where people were like, what it means to do equity work is to put equity at the center of our work. And I actually don't agree with that unless you actually are an equity organization, then sure, put equity at the center. But um, like at one point I talked to one equity manager and they were like, I think we should be doing rent assistance. And I'm like, what? Because there's other agencies that do that. Um, and we are clean water agencies, like whether you're a consultant or you work at a public agency, we have a really important job to do. And if we don't center that in our work, it's not like some other city department's gonna casually pick up wastewater treatment. Like, okay, we're gonna go do rent assistance. It's not like, well, 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 maybe somebody else will decide to take on wastewater treatment. It's not gonna work out that way. So I think one of the things that can happen with green is there's a sense of lack of hierarchy and structure about things. And what that can do is they can start to put equity before their core mission. 
And it's really about integrating them together. And when you put equity above your actual core mission, we're kind of losing something there. And I remember talking to someone from ODOT and they were like, well, maybe we should just do sidewalk projects now because there's more small businesses that can do sidewalks. And I'm like, well, I mean, we're just gonna let bridges fall down or what exactly are we talking about here? And it was very well-intentioned. And you know, I worked with small businesses for a living, but I'm like, that is a warping of your purpose. Your purpose is as a transportation agency and there's tons of opportunity, especially the transportation agency to integrate equity into how you do your work, but you can't lose sight about what your work is. And I think the other thing for green is embracing systems and outcomes. Um, one thing that does happen with organizations that get more green is that you start having um, hierarchy starts to be done kind of in back rooms because we don't like doing that stuff in public. I mean, in front of the staff, um, not public public. So what happens is people have these long workshops and everyone gets to have a say. And then often those don't quite reach conclusion because actually even in a green organization, everyone doesn't have equal say because some people have more experience. Some people have areas of responsibility and they have more decision-making authority. So what you kind of see is that you go to the workshop and everyone's all listening to everybody. People don't like to disagree too much with each other. And then after the meeting in that other room, the people who really decide make the decision and they just tell people what happened. And that can be very destructive. You think you got everybody to have a say, but actually it's more frustrating to get to have a say and then have it ignored and you don't even get the feedback about why. It would have been nicer to hear it up front, like hear it to your face about what they didn't like. And this is often what happens with public process, right? We go out to the public and we're like, we want to hear from you. And then we never close the loop or explain why we did what we did. And so I see that happening within organizations as well. And I do really appreciate like Seattle Public Utilities process where they do the um, very overt about who gets to make a decision and being transparent about it. And I wish more people were being internally transparent about that in these types of organizations, so. So how do we actually bring this all together? You're like, wow, do I just have to like every initiative? I'm just gonna think like, how could I put three buzzwords in it, one for each and I'm gonna, <laughs> um, you know, it's not about flip-flopping from one way of being to another, it's about integration. And I think sometimes when we go to do equity, we take the way it is now, we're like, we wanna turn it on its head. Like we don't have enough input from people of color into our decisions. So what about if we just gave them all the power and just asked lay people to make our decisions for us? Not a good plan. But you know, it's actually kind of easy. Well, until you find out what the decision is, it can be quite easy um, because that's kind of a lazy form of equity to be like, okay, well, I'm just gonna ask a brown person and that's my work there. The work is in on not having authentic conversations and empowering people to be part of those conversations and then talking with them and integrating it into the work that we do. And that's just a lot harder than just trying to flip everything on its head. So to me, that's kind of the work of equity is I always say we're trying to thread the needle between what different groups want and what we're passionate about and advancing racial equity and advancing um, justice in our communities and still doing our core mission. And there's a lot of kind of the threading the needle between all those different possibilities to find where, where those opportunities are. So that's why I'll encourage you is to think about about these different perspectives and instead of rejecting the value systems that maybe you're not very strong in, maybe that's not a thing that you were raised in or not a thing that you relate to, to try to appreciate each of these value systems do have positive things about them and to find a way to connect in a positive way with those. So I finished one minute early, but we have 10 minutes for questions. And I'll just say, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or um, that's my email if you wanna connect. Thank you, Nikki. Um, we, because this is a live session, we'll have you um, take the mic when you have a question. And I will be checking the live chat if you are attending virtually. Um, does anyone have any questions to begin with? I can ask you one while people are still thinking about sure. things. So are you still canceled at your kid's school? Uh, <laughs> I actually, I never thought I'd do this, but I paid for my child to go to private school to leave. I was gonna, yeah, that was gonna be like, yeah. if they still go there. You know, it, it was like a huge thing. And it's, it's funny because of course I wouldn't shut up because people who know me, they're like, oh, they just wanted me to stop and I wouldn't stop. And uh, the reason why I wouldn't stop actually is not because I thought I would change their mind, but actually because I 
worried that people were going to be bullied into not sending their kids to school. By the way, what percentage, when the, so this all happened when it was hybrid school and people were really trying to pressure people not to send their kids. How, what percent of kids do you think might have gone back in my school to hybrid school in this environment? Yes. Come on, say a number. It was 70. It was 70. And the people who are the dominant voices were shocked because they had so screamed everyone else out that they actually believed everyone thought like them. And they thought I was the weird outlier. Um, and it turned out that actually the people, the families of color, school, they don't listen to their people. <laughs> those people, they're like, those people aren't for me anyways. I don't know what they're doing over there, but they got nothing to do with me. But yeah, so I think it was a big surprise. Ooh, yeah, Jane. got a question here. Okay. I love that we're going to try to get more people on interview panels that look like you so that you feel mm -hmm. um, like it's a safe space. But in organizations that don't maybe have a lot of people of color or women and already working in those mm -hmm. positions, how do we ensure that we don't take advantage of the few people that are there um, taking up a lot of those interview um, panels, not taking up, but having to be asked to be yeah. on all of those interview panel spots? I get that is a really tricky situation. I mean, it is a burden to have to do that. And I think some people enjoy doing that and some people really don't. Um, if you're the one black person at an organization and people want you to be on every single interview panel, that would be extremely tiresome. Um, so I think part of it is having a conversation about what people wanna do. Some people are passionate about that. Like there are some people who would love to be on every panel for someone who looks like them to try to welcome more people in the organization and other people are like, look, I want to be a wastewater specialty person and this isn't, you know, equity is not my jam. And um, so I think part of it is just having a conversation about it. But I get a lot of people are kind of stuck in this catch 22. They're like, we want to have more diverse staff, but we don't have them yet. And how do we do that? The other thing I always say to white men who are asking those questions are like, I literally don't have anyone to put on this panel <laughs> is in this position. As I say, be upfront with it. And if you show that you're comfortable talking about the topic, I'm not trying to say that solves the whole problem, but if you can show that you're comfortable talking about race to a person of color, that definitely puts you above somebody who can't do that. So I would just be super open about it and demonstrate that you care about the topic and that you are fluent, you can comfortably talk about it. Like to me, if I was a black person, I go interview somewhere, I would just like to know that those white people in front of me can say black without like squirming. If they kind of say like African American, I'm like, I'm not coming here. <laughs> So I think, and I've even encountered like men who don't know whether to say women or, I mean, I was at one company and they're like, do I say ladies or I don't know what? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, just being comfortable, even saying simple words um, and being able to speak to it goes a really long way. So. Do we have any other questions? Oh, come on. More questions? <laughs> Oh, that one right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll do it in the microphone. Oh, sorry. So I serve on Clean Water Commission, mm -hmm. and we always have a problem with recruiting our commissioners. There's nine people mm -hmm. because everyone's either white and educated and reaching to a community to get more volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it's not a huge time commitment, but it is a time commitment. What would you suggest that we can do for that? Another difficult one. I will say there are ample opportunities for people of color to spend their time without compensation to diversify all sorts of organizations. And I think one thing people can do is start offering compensation. Um, I said before, you could be a professional person of color. It is not a, um, actually, a, it doesn't pay anything, but you could literally spend your whole life going around. Like I look at Portland's minority evaluator program. I'm a minority evaluator. It takes a lot of work and you are the only person not being paid to be there. And it's really easy. And you know, it's sold as like, it's a benefit and it is interesting being on panels and things, but in the end it's still, everyone else there's being paid except you. Um, and I've come up with this one doing public involvement, like calling communities of color to get input. And they're like, you haven't given us anything. And I know I'm getting paid 250 bucks an hour to be on that call and they're getting paid $0. And so I think a lot of it comes down to compensation. Like when we start thinking about how to engage 
communities. There's Serena Fasthorse over there who's amazing. And she has a new business around engaging indigenous community. And a lot of the things that we've been working on that's so hard is how do we compensate people for their time and energy? And I think until we start compensating people, we're not gonna really get out of that because if we have these volunteer positions that take a lot of time and energy and we aren't gonna compensate people, it just means you have to be a really privileged person to, to sit there. And without compensation, I think we're not gonna solve a lot of those problems. I don't really care what kind of outreach we kind of do because, because people need to get paid for their work. And if you're lucky enough to be able to work without being paid, good on you, but there's just a lot of people in this world who can't, so. I know that was a non-solution. Hi, hi, Nikki, Mark Bowling. Um, I have a question about a lot of the, the three colors to me parallel organizational structures and systems, which mm. I think is fascinating. Uh, I hadn't mm. seen that kind of connection before. But when you, so for me, I'm a rules follower. Mm. And so whenever we talk in the organization about rules, I will argue and argue and argue because once the rule's set, I got to follow. Right. So when you look at organizations that perhaps are, are predominantly falling in one of those areas, but perhaps if the community of color tends to view the world differently, do you have a hard time? How do you? How do you bridge some of those cultural gaps and uh, mm. to bring folks in? Um, I don't know if it's really the rules, like that the rules go against communities of color. Um, I was thinking of yeah. like of the blue, say order and process. Yes, right? yes. You know, I think of, um, I'm going to go a little random here because I have to think a little bit about this. So Mirio Design is an example of a very blue consulting organization. They're a minority owned business. And they have a very distinctly different culture than other consulting firms. Like I've worked a lot with them and they are very family oriented. You know, he gives a lot of his profits to charity. He's very about the being with them during the pandemic. You know, they had people who had kids at home and they're like actively trying to help that person, like trying to, uh, because they couldn't get childcare, they had a new baby and they're like doing everything, bending over backwards to support that person. And they do view people as individuals and they're about family and they're about giving back. And it's just a really, really different culture. And to me, that's a very blue and it's, they have a ton of people of color working there and they have a ton of people who came from small towns working there. And I'm like, I, I kind of get that. Like they've got more people of color in Emirio working there than I could count like multiple big firms. If I counted all their people of color and all their big companies in the Portland area, there's more just at this one company. And it's not just because they see representation, it's easy to say that, but it's actually because the culture itself um, relates to the culture that's comfortable to them. And I think utilities do have a culture that can be, it's just about whether within the blue value system, there can still be insiders and outsiders, right? That it is about taking care of your own. Um, green cares about taking care of community in a very nebulous kind of conceptual way. And blues like, so for example, people in blue value system, sometimes they're not as supportive of government programs because they're like, it's your job to take care of your community. You, you know, a lot of people might be in churches. They're like, you take care of your community. You don't wait for the government to go take care of your neighbor. It's your job to take care of your neighbor. And it's my job to take care of my neighbor. And I think that's a lot of the things that people misunderstand because it is coming from that sense that you need to take care of your own. So it can still be very isolating to people of color if they're not part of us. So I think in those types of organizations, not so much the culture of what the rules are or something like that, it's more about how do you make a place where you can bring them into your us, like into our we, right? Because that's really where the barriers, and you see that a lot with women going into some of those organizations, they don't have women in the field staff yet, or they have very few, and it's quite a barrier to get, because it's like, how do you make them feel included? So, yeah. All right, we might have time for one very, very quick question, if anyone has one. All right, if not, we're gonna end right on time at 11.10. Um, you can bring your CEU forms to Shelby back here in the corner by the door if you haven't already. And uh, thank you so much, Nikki. Let's give her a round of applause. Yeah,